Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through various RPG products that I have and I give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm gonna be going through all of the Dolmenwood pre-release PDFs for Kickstarter backers. Essentially, these are the not quite finished, but almost finished versions of the player's book, the campaign book, and the monster book of the new Dolmenwood setting. First of all, you guys should get this. Period. Done right there. Go get this setting as soon as you possibly can. In print, if possible, because you can pre-order it, or PDF, if, if, you, if you want that and you prefer that. First of all, the art in these books is the standout feature. The art in these books is amazing. And I know a lot of other people have done breakdowns of Dolmenwood in its various forms. You know, during the Kickstarter and early on the Kickstarter, there were reviews of it and previews of it. Um, I just want to go through each of these books briefly and give you a sense of what you can get in them. There is so much material here for such a fantastic setting. I love the Dolman Wood setting. I've talked about it before in my Wormskin reviews. Um, I've talked about it in when I talked about Winter's Daughter. I think the, the setting, the tone, the presentation, the mechanics, the ideas are just brilliant. So highly recommend already, first things first. Now I'm gonna go through it a bit and just give you guys again a sense of what you're gonna get if you get these books. Dolman Wood Player's book first. Now these aren't finished. But they're close to being done. Um, they are almost done. Here's the table of context. You, contents you can see, for example, there's a piece of art that should be here. It's not in this version yet, but eventually it will. Now, when these books finally do come out in print, I will actually do a review of them too, because I have the entire set. I'll just do like a, a review of everything that I've got. But up until then, this will have to do for a, a bit of a review. And it's not really going to be a review so much as just a flip through and me kind of gushing a little bit <laughs> about these things because they're so good. So you get Welcome, Starting Play, the Kindreds that you can play, the Classes. Now this is based on sort of a version of Old School Essentials, but it has its own particular sets of rules as it relates to Class Kindred and as it relates to magic, certain kinds of magic. And then there are certain other subsystems in here that are developed specifically for this campaign setting. So keep that in mind if you want to run this game out of the book, you're going to be playing a version of OSE, a very close version of Old School Essentials. But uh, you could also just adjust it for whatever system you want to do. Like, I might play it in this system, but I might just adjust it and run it for Shadow Dark when it comes out. So, oh, look at this art. So dang good. Welcome to Dolmenwood. This reminds me of the art from, like, The Secret of Kells, or those uh, sort of cartoons from that uh, that company. I don't know what company that is. I think they're associated with Ghibli, actually, on some level, like Ghibli America or something like that. Um, or Ghibli Europe or something like that. I don't know. They're associated with that. I think. I could be wrong about that. But they are unique, and the style of art, like Song of the Sea, Wolf Walkers, it just it brings you right into this whimsical, rather dangerous fey world that is medieval, but not high medieval so much. And certainly, not, uh, you know, it brings to mind things like Legend from the 1980s as well, as you'll see as you go through with that. I love this picture on the right here. A great example of the sort of whimsy and beauty and underlying darkness with that skeleton in the, uh, in the, in the underbrush there. The Journey Begins. So this is a book that you would give to your players, and it starts off with a great thing. It starts off with the inspirational media. Now, if you're giving this book to your players, or you're going to read it to them, or just give them some of the pages from it, it's a great idea to give them the inspiration for the setting, right? I don't know why we don't do this when we start campaigns. Hey guys, I want to do a campaign set in this world. Here's the sort of tone that I'm thinking of. And you give like five novel or like five books or like a movie or like some music or something. That's great. So here's the inspiration uh, for this setting for Dolmenwood. You get Lord Dunsany, Tolkien, Christina Rossetti, uh, Susanna Clarke, obviously, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell comes through here quite a bit. Uh, there is uh, some Neil Gaiman, <laughs> which I like. I love Neil Gaiman. Of course, there's Miyazaki with Princess Mononoke and Spirited Away, as well as some stranger things like The Wicker Man, right? Um, so, and Twin Peaks, for example, <laughs> by Mark Frost and David Lynch. Oh, and of course, yeah, Over the Garden Wall, which I saw for the very first time this past autumn. I loved it. It's a great cartoon series. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. You can get uh, free character sheets and calendars on the Dolmenwood website. And the calendar is really cool because the, the calendar of this world is, is really important. Saints, feast days, and the non-seasons, which happen in between the unseasons, which happen in between regular seasons and things like that. It's an important part of the setting in the world. So that calendar is pretty cool. And they have a, uh, an easy one for you to follow through and, and just check things off as you go through. 
Um, you get the folk and the factions of Dolmenwood. You get Breggles, Mosslings, Fairies, and demi fae And then there's some other sentient creatures as well that you can run into. Birds or animals that you might, might be able to, to speak. But then, of course, humans. Humans are the main um, thing that you're running into in this world. You get different factions. Uh, and there's a lot of them. Quite a few factions. The Pluritine Church, the Duchy of Brackenwald, the Cold Prince, the Naglord, the Druin, the Witches, and Ygrain, the Sorceress. Then there is the most commonly traversed or spoken of regions in the woods. And again, you're giving this to your players, probably, at least. They're going to see it, or you could you could take this information and give it to them very quickly. Here's a starting play. You have a to-do page. So obviously, again, it's not quite done. But I love this piece of art for town. On playing role-playing playing games. It's going to be two pages of advice on what role-playing games are and how to approach them. That sort of advice, I, you know, I will leave, you know, TBD here because I, as I've made very clear multiple times, I don't tend to like it. But if this book is for players and you are, especially if you're kind of giving this to new players, I can see this being useful as long as it's, you know, brief and not just overly generic advice of player character and you know that sort of thing. Uh, some terminology, which is important, uh, obviously. Now these books, by the way, this is 200 pages. So I'm going to be going through it pretty quickly because it's 200 pages for just this book alone. And there are, the other books are quite large as well. Basic statistics, it's giving you an overview of kind of what you're looking at in terms of old school essentials. So if you don't know old school essentials, you're going to need to know a lot of this terminology. Um, but it's straightforward in, in, in role-playing game terms. Here's how you create a character with graphic to be added, character sheet with numbered steps. So it tells you what you're going to be getting, which is awesome to have a character sheet with numbered steps and in that there's an image of that. I like that a lot. A summary of your classes, you're going to get Cleric, Enchanter, Fighter, Friar, Hunter, Knight, Magician, Minstrel, and Thief. Those are your classes. And you can also pick a Kindred to go along with them. And some of them are restricted, so Elves, Grimalkin, and Woodgrews can't be Clerics or Friars. Um, everything else here is fairly straightforward in what you'd expect from an OSE style of game. Rolling your abilities, cho scores, choosing Kindreds, how to create your characters. Uh, what the ability scores are and how they do it. So it really is giving you like old school essentials. It, it, this, these books give you everything you need to play. Mostly it's from old school essentials, but it has its own twists here and there. So you don't really need the old school essentials books to play this game. You can play, if you have the three Dolmenwood books, you can pretty much play the entirety. Uh, it's, it's its own game as well. Here are your languages that you have. Um, I love these. I love these. The common tongue, the bragel tongues, the scriptural tongues, the drunic tongues, the mosling tongue, and the fairy tongues. There's different forms of the tongue of fairy. I think sometimes you get in like 5e, you get like sylvan and uh, maybe like elvish, and there's a few different languages there. In this, you get the immortal tongue of fairy, which no mortal or lesser fairy may speak. There's high elfish, there's mule, and then there's sylvan. There's different kinds of uh, fairy tongues, which is great. Woldish and Old Woldish, Caprice and Gaff, Liturgic, Drunic and Old Drunic. Languages are one of the easiest ways to get your players involved in a setting. I really, I don't know why. If you haven't done that before, just try it. Change the languages and make them specific to your setting and make give reasons to know the different languages to your players, and they will have an immediate connection into the setting um, on their character sheet, and it gives them a different way of thinking about their characters. Why would my character know this specific language? If it's particular and peculiar to your setting and you give a reason for them to know it, they'll really enjoy that. Here are the different kindreds. Uh, races, as they are uh, called in older like, editions of the game. Kindreds, as they are here. Mortals, fairies, and demi fae the three kinds of kindreds. And then you get mortal kindreds, bregles, uh, basically f uh, goat men. Uh, and there's short horns and long horns. How they level up, because again, this is OSE, so you're talking about uh, advancement and, and how they change as they level up. I think there's rules in the end for race as class. In fact, I, I'm almost certain that there is race as class towards the end, but you can leave it aside. Tons of pages for randomly generating your characters, for your backgrounds, your trinkets, and then your descriptions. That's awesome. A bunch of D12 tables. You get elves, ageless fairies. Your elf names, and I love these kinds of names, right? Rustic names and courtly names. Begets only dreams. Violet and Clementine. Slips behind shadows. I just love those names. So flavorful, and they fit right in with this idea of these names are bad translations from something much more beautiful and, and a concept that is much more, you know, just uh, kind of 
it gets right at the, the heart of what the person is. Elves seem pretty powerful, pretty cool. They get a lot of cool abilities. But they also have limitations. All the fairies do. They have uh, particular weaknesses, vulnerabilities. Grimalkin are mercurial feline fairies. Sort of like Puss in Boots or the Cheshire Cat, for example. Uh, great if you want to play it. Now this is also something that might not appeal to some people, the sorts of animals as uh, players as playing animals and things like that. But I think it's really appealing to especially younger players playing animals. So it, you know you could take these out easily enough if you don't like them. But I think I think you might like them. <laughs> humans and straightforward descriptions of the humans in this particular setting. But you still get all the same stuff. It doesn't leave it in the background. Lots of good tables. Mosslings, which are sort of earth fungus things, uh, woody humanoids made of. They had their their flesh hosts mosses, molds, and fungi. Symbiotic flesh. And one thing that I will say is that as the art in this book is released and more and more artists released, I am more and more in favor of it. At first, there was just a couple artists, and one was great, and the other one wasn't my favorite. As the art was being early developed, uh, I really like the art direction that the game has gone in now as opposed to maybe where it was in the zines. Some of the zines had great art, but often I didn't actually like some of the way that it was presented. And I really prefer the way that this art is presented here. Here are the classes that you can have. The clerics, and I love the way that cl clerics uh, learn their spells, or rather that their spells, each of them, is associated with a miracle. We'll see that later. Enchanters, and they get fairy runes and fairy magic and the way that it works are really cool. I'll talk about that again in a bit. One of the reasons why I want to play this game kind of as written is just for the magic system alone. Fighters, but they get talents, so they get a more specialization than just your standard OSE warrior fighter class. Friars, uh, which are sort of a mix of different, you know, holy magic and a little bit more uh, ability to survive on their own than clerics do. But they get uh, poverty and they also get turning undead and things like that. Uh, poverty is not something really you get, but it's one of their conditions, I should say. Hunters, cool animal companion hunters, right? Knights, and you get the lower houses of Dolmenwood, and you have a code of chivalry to follow, maybe more uh, paladin-esque, but they're great. I love, I love the knight class here. Magicians, and these guys are more traditional arcane magic casters from OSE. They cast spells more along the lines of standard D&D magic. I love it how you can have a starting spellbook, and it's a named spellbook, right? Charms of the Fey Court, which contains these spells, or Smythe's Ill Illuminations, which contains these sp uh, particular spells. That is so awesome. Spellbooks that are named and are artifacts in the world. Even level one starting spellbooks are actual books. This is not just your spellbook. This is Lord Oberon's Seals. That's so good, and I think there's a lot of players who love that sort of thing. Minstrels. They get counter charms, bards, as you might expect. Get the standard bard stuff. Thieves, where what game doesn't have thieves? What good RPG doesn't have thieves or a thief-like class? Uh, and then you get magic itself. And there's different kinds of magic. As I said, there's arcane magic, divine magic, and then there's fairy magic. So arcane magic is just the standard D&D &D kind of spells. You get ranks in spells, you level up them, you memorize them, you cast them. Standard OSE kind of style of magic. And you have the ranks here of magic and what they do. There's some really cool ones in this book, particular spells in this book. And it would be very easy to add in spells from your system of choice. OSC spells are really versatile that way. How long they last, the range, and what they do. The behavior, uh, the speech and spells, and the attacks. Or different, I guess, that's not always the same. <laughs> I was just reading mirror image. Uh, but each of them have bit descriptions. I love the layout here. You have bolding, you have... Uh, italics and parenthesis to make it clear the different elements of this spell. Uh, rank 3, rank 4, rank 5. Oh, and rank 6 spells. Then you get fairy magic, and this is what I love, love, love. Okay, so look at this right here. Rune usage frequency. This section right here. So a caster, there's different kinds of runes, right? There's lesser runes, greater runes, and mighty runes. And depending on your level, you can cast those runes different amount of time. So if you're a lesser, if you're a first to fourth level caster, you can cast lesser runes once per day. You can cast greater level, greater runes once per level, and mighty runes once ever. And then if you're level five through nine, you can cast lesser twice per day, greater once per week, and mighty runes once ever. And if you're a tenth or higher level of caster, you can cast lesser runes thrice per day, greater once per day, mighty once per year. 
That's so cool. So these runes that are very powerful towards the end, you're only going to be casting a handful of times, maybe once ever. So if you want to play an enchanter, right, one of the order of a fairy class who can use fairy magic, there's glamour, which you can use all the time, but then there are these runes, which are much more like, we're going to do this, and it's going to be a significant thing to do. I love that. I think that's so cool. Here are the different glamours that you can get if you're one of the uh, fairies who have innate powers. And then you have the lesser runes, you have the greater runes and the mighty runes. For, so for example, summon the wild hunt, right? That's one of the greater runes. Duration, 1d6 hours or until successful. Range, appears in the caster's presence. This is, if you were a level one caster and you found this rune, you could cast it once and then you're done. Uh, this rune invokes the blasting of ghostly horns, summoning forth a hunting host from the wild woods of fairy. Composition. The wild hunt is composed as follows. 4d6 fairy hounds, 4d20 elf hunters on foot, 4d20 elf hunters mounted on fairy horses, 1d6 goblin horn blowers. Hunting. The caster may direct the fairy host to chase a specific quarry. Duration. The host remains in the mortal world until the hunt is successful or until 1d6 hours have passed. That's incredible. I love that. And then you have holy magic and how you get spells. You can pray to the saints once per day, receiving the blessings in the form of spells. You get certain numbers at certain places. And then as you go to these shrines across Dolmenwood, you can pray for an hour and you get the blessing of the, of the saint in the form of additional spells. So basically you, from here on out, you can now learn this new spell because you visited the shrine. That is so cool. And it gives you a reason, a built-in reason, a class built-in reason to travel around the setting because you can go, oh, oh, we should go there. There's a shrine to so-and-so there. I haven't picked up that spell yet. We could go there and pray at the shrine and I'll get their miracle. That's so cool. I love that. And then each of these spells has a miracle associated with it. So how that how that saint is able to give this particular effect. So detect evil is also called Saint Wittery's vision. And there's the miracle of Saint Wittery in the woods so that you can learn that in game and learn why and the, the patronage of that saint. And definitions of evil, intent only, etc. But you can detect it. That's awesome. And you have a whole bunch of these. Rank one, two, three, four, five, up through the Mossling Neck. So you have five of these ranks of spells, and some of them are very, very powerful. Then you get Mossling Knacks. Mosslings have sort of these not quite magic, but kind of magic things they can do, which is really cool. Then you get the standard stuff that you might find in a book. Equipment services and animals. Adventuring gear and the costs and descriptions of each of them. Armor and weapons, horses and vehicles, hounds. Hounds is really cool. You have loyal companions for the traveler on lonely roads. So there's, uh, you can pick up animal companions. Uh, like a lich hound, or a sealy dog, or a dapper. Let's see what the dapper says. Curly furred dogs with huge floppy ears and great fringes that obscure their eyes. Dappers are favored by the noble classes for their curious love of dressing in preposterous outfits and performing amusing dances. That's very cute. And language, have, they have the ability to mimic speech. They can be trained to mimic up to 10 words so they have no inkling of their meaning. Uh, lodging and food, common food, fancy food. Beverages, lots of different beverages. If you remember from one of the, the Dolmenwood zines, there was spiritus beverages that was sort of random tables that you could roll on to find the different kinds of drinks. You have pipe leaf, another kind of pipe leaf here. Common fungi and herbs. Specialist services. So if you want to get guides, builders, mercenaries, rowers, sages, etc. And then retainers, stalwart companions for journeys into places drear. Applicants, locating them, hiring them, offering wages, retaining loyalty, and advancement. And you get the adventuring section, a great piece of art with fairies and the wood group. Well, no, these aren't wood group, sorry, these are Grimalkin, excuse me. Basic game procedure. Description, clarification, action, judgment, resolution. So standard stuff for DMs. An example of play, which isn't done yet, preparing for an adventure. And the different roles, you have the caller, the chronicler, the mapper, and the quartermaster. So you give kind of a meta role to the different players at the table. Um, and then you have planning, uh, which, you know, what's your adventure objective, what's your preparation, what's your marching order, and then how, you're, how are we going to divide treasure? And then uh, adventuring advice. Work as a team, think outside the box, use time wisely, avoid unnecessary combat, and know when to back out. So this is, again, advice for the party, not from DM. So this implies you're going to give this whole book, or at least you're going to um, let, you know, parts of it, maybe, to your players. The core rules of the game. All the stuff that you know if you know OSE, and if you don't, you'll, you'll probably have to read through this stuff. Time and movement, encumbrance, hazards and challenges, hunger and thirst, all the different kinds of things you can have there. Travel. Now, this is a sort of an interesting way of doing travel. It's more procedural. Um, 
travel points per day of a certain speed, and then you have a certain number of points that you uh, use up, basically. Um, and it just goes through how many um, hexes you can do and, and the different amounts of vehicles, resting, searching hexes, and all the procedures for that. Same with camping. There's a special set of procedures for camping. You set activities, you set up activities, camp activities, watches through the night, wandering monsters, sleep, and waking up. And there is a rule for quick camping, but that's an optional rule. Otherwise, you do all of this stuff. And there's different activities you can do. Set up activities, camp activities, watches, wandering, and then sleep. Settlements. And again, the procedure for a settlement. Weather, decide actions, random encounters, description, end of day, and random encounters. Again, if there are random encounters at night. So if you're doing downtime, you're spending some time in a settlement, this is how you do it. Just run through it day by day. Dungeons and dungeon procedure. Now again, if you know OSE, you'll know that it's very procedure driven. There's lots of good procedures for how to do things like dungeon crawling, right? And that's what you have here. Rules for movement, rules for resting, uh, for exiting. If you have a, this, I love exiting rules. Um, if you don't want to just randomly go back, there's rules for how to exit quickly and you can do dungeon escape rules and things like that. I like that. Encounter, and again, there's very set sequence. Surprise, encounter distance, initiative, actions, and conclusion go through it. Combat, same thing. Sequence. Other combat matters. If you want to attack with two weapons or you want to do non-lethal attacks or you want to push your opponent and examples of combat which are not done yet. And then the appendices at the back of this book. But you have a calendar, the noble houses, religion, the Bregel kindred classes, the elf kindred classes. This is if you want to do classes race, Mosling kindreds, wood grues, and then thanks page with some credits. And then at the very end, you get a map of Dolmenwood, a player map of Dolmenwood, which was much more whimsical and less objective than the map you get in the DM's guide or in the uh, GM's, the campaign book, which is much more, you know, hexes, you see the distances, you see the hexes and the overlay and all that. This is just sort of an in, almost in world. You read it and you get a sense of where things are. The players are going to get a sense of where things are. Now, I like that you're just given at a glance in the player book, the whole of Dolmenwood. The map is revealed to you, at least on some level, from the beginning, with art indicating what might be where things are, right? I like that a lot. So the players have more information than less. And if you're going to be doing something like a hex crawl or a region like this, a region crawl, the players need to be able to kind of see where they're going. It's very important. And then you get adventuring gear, and the back pages have that. So this is the main player's book of Dolmenwood in its form currently. It's not done yet, but uh, this is the form that we currently have. This on its own is one of the best books I have in terms of RPG products. This on its own is worth the price of admission. Just get the player's book and you could run tons of it, but there's so much more because you now have the Dolmenwood campaign book, which is almost 500 pages. Now there's no way I'm even gonna be able to scratch the surface on this. 500 pages of material. I'm just gonna go through a little bit because there's no, again, I can't go through all of it. You have 200 pages of hex descriptions. That's incredible. And this book has so much work that's gone into it. 200 pages of hex descriptions. You guys seriously need to, uh, you guys need to get this book, these, these books. All right, Secrets of Dolmenwood. Uh, welcome, Master of Dolmens. So the world around Dolmenwood, what's in this book, and all the information in it. You get great art here, what you're going to be doing, how you're going to run the game. I think this is excellent. Regions and the regions of Dolmenwood. Lots of brief descriptions of the different parts of it with some awesome art. Broken up into very clear visual uh, images, visual images, very clear images of the sections that are being talked about. Highlighted maps on each page. Just masterclass in terms of being... Uh, in terms of layout, right? I mean, just so much, so much good formatting here and so many good ideas. History and the overview of the world of this particular setting, I should say. The beginning of days, prehistory, 2,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,900 years ago, 1,800 years ago, and then it goes down in the major period, 1,700, 1,500, 12, 11, 10, 9, 850, 600, 400, all the way down to the present day. The ley lines and the standing stones, because that's a big key feature of Dolmenwood, obviously Dolmenwood, standing stones. You're going to get a lot of these standing stones, and they all have important features, and they all do important things in the world, and they can be used by players um, mechanically. So if they find the secrets of these ley lines and these, lay st these standing stones, they can use them to their advantage. The Ring of Chell, which is a particular place. Breaking the ward, you don't want to necessarily do that. 
and the various shrines of Dolmenwood by all the different saints you can run into. St. Sedge, St. Dank, St. Egwort, St. Pastory, St. Key, St. Gondu, St. Lilibeth. Love that. Shrines that have been lost and how to restore them. And fairy. Doors into fairy. Because, of course, the world of fairy is an entirely different thing beyond this one. And, and it's an important behind the scenes, and actually, I'm sure, well, front and center, place to adventure and encounter in this world. Fairy roads, ways that you can travel very quickly through the roads of fairy. You don't want to stray from the path in the fairy road. With some great descriptions of locations on that road and the different ones. This reminds me of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, right? The, the, the place behind the mirrors that he goes, the, the king's roads. It's so great. Fairy nobles and the particular fairy nobles. You get the Blind King, the Cold Prince, Duke Myfleur, the Duke Who Cherishes Dreams, the Earl of Yellow, the Goblin King, the Hag Thorn Rosie, King Puskin, Lady Belladonna, Lady of Midnight, the Lady of Spring Unending. Now the art here is very whimsical, it's very weird. This is the style of art more that I'm not as keen on, but it's interesting that it's pretty consistent through the Fae Lords and Ladies. So they are, they are definitely other than the sort of more players grounded handbook art which I think is cool, gives you that sense of difference. Then you get the wood gods, some really cool ones. And again, the style of art is different because you're talking about a very different kind of thing. Great picture here with factions and powers, the crown, the church, and the dream. Uh, the nine-legged chaos godling and its horde of wicked minions, a Tanue. Members and organizations, a terrifying piece of art for this, the Nag Lord. And then those who are involved in its worship. The Cold Prince, and where on the map you can find enclaves of the Cold Prince. Members and organization of the Cold Prince's faction, the Droon, great faction here. Members and organization, human nobility, and the different noble houses of Dolmenwood. If you're a knight, or you're, one of your characters is playing a knight, this is going to be matter uh, greatly. The Longhorn nobility, if you're playing a, a Bregel, it's also going to be important here. And the different faction overview of these lords. The Pluritine Church and the importance of the church in this game. Uh, different things that the church wants to do. Different places where they're important, how their miracles and magic work, etc. And different enclaves on the right there. With members and organization. Really cool stuff. Uh, the Witches of Dolmenwood and what they want and where they are, the queen of all witches, and faction relationships. So how these factions relate to one another and who are, uh, you know, which are going to be helping each other out, which ones might work together, which ones hate each other. I love this breakdown. It's very, very good. Factions and adventures and the different kinds of adventures and example quests for each of the factions that you might have. Then there is the hag, a particular Person. She's a corrupt fairy princess, exiled to the mortal world, and she's the cursed way, cursed warden of the way to Absinthe, which is one of the, um, well, it's the kingdom of Absinthe in the land of fairy. Egraine, mysterious sorceress, and then campaigns in Dolmenwood. Now, this is one section that I absolutely love, and it's this idea on customizing tone. And it goes through setting expectations, whimsy and horror, the time period, fairy and its denizens, and the role of the church, right? These different things that different tables are going to find to be better or to like or to not like. Content to be alighted, content to be omitted. Whimsy and horror presentation and how that works, removing elements and where you might remove them. Um, time periods, firearms you could easily add in. Fairy and denizens, this is kind of the idea here. Might be more inclined to limit access to fairy. And uh, if you don't have an invitation, then the players can't get there. So just never give them an invitation. So you don't have to worry about going into there. If the players, if you don't want to do that, the players don't want to do that. And then the role of the church, depending on if you want to make them more authoritarian and kind of like inquisitorial or more helpful and, and jolly and, and, and joining up with the people and stuff like that. You don't have to make the church evil, which it's just, you know, at this point, it's a pretty tired trope of the evil church that's dominating everything. It's like we've seen that in almost every fantasy setting. So I like they're like, yeah, you can, you don't have to go that way with this church. And the same thing is true for all the factions. You don't have to take them in the stereotypical way that they're almost always presented in most fantasy worlds. You can do your own thing. All right, the plot-driven campaigns or player-driven campaigns and how to mix campaign styles as well. Lots of pages of DM advice, 
that are mostly still to do. How to award XP, campaign themes, which I think is great. And there's also still a lot to do here. But there's these different ways of doing what is the whole campaign about the return of the cold prince, the intrigue in the high world, etc. So those are different things you can do. Still lots and lots of advice here to be done. Design dungeons, still stuff to be doing. Uh, but some great advice for how to map dungeons and create dungeons. I don't know if this is the best dungeon design advice I've ever seen. It's only really a couple pages, but there are lots of resources out there. And it's certainly sufficient to get you making your own campaigns and stuff here. Dungeons, environments, uh, traps, secret doors, tricks and weirdness, and then exploring the wild and how to do that. Seasons and unseasons, weather, getting lost, encounters in the wild, regional encounters in the different parts. Um, awesome. Fishing and how fishing uh, might go with lots of different edible fish that you can find. <laughs> Foraging and the different fungi and plants that you can find. How to identify them, how to hunt, and what kinds of things you can get there. And then the settlements of Dolmenwood, the major ones with maps, which I love these maps. They're simple uh, overlays of the, of the cities, and you can see all the major locations at a glance. Blackswell and the different places. Castle Brackenwold. Castle and the inner city with lots of different locations and NPCs and um, hooks and rumors and all of that in all of these places. Uh, Cobden on the ship, a little town. Dreg and the Shantywood Isle, Fort Vulgar, High Hankel, Lankshorn or Lankshorn, and Meager's Reach, Odd, Orb Swallow, Prigwort. I love Prigwort, it's one of my favorite. And Woodcutter's Encampment. And then you get the hex descriptions. Now I'm only gonna do a couple of these because there's 200 pages of them, so I'm just gonna go through a few. Here's the format. You get the header, geographical info, local area map, and the features. And you get 0101, the spectral manse. So you get a description very briefly at the top with the terrain, uh, lost or encounters, how likely you are to be lost and how uh, what you're going to run into if you're there, and foraging. Then you get the spectral manse itself and a description of it, how to enter it, what the interior is like, the inhabitants there, um, exploring it and leaving it, along with the rooms there, uh, the particular people you might find, and then a D8 encounter table for this place. And then you get Reed Wall. And then you get the Golden Goose. And then you get the Phantom Lighthouse. The Domain of Fror Gryphus. The Outlook and the Red Monolith. Weeping Woman. The Cabbage Plot. Lady Bored and Merkin's Army. The Shadow of Lord Gruff, Wishing Pit. It goes on and on and on. Towards the end, you get, in part seven, treasures and oddments, placing treasure and the kinds of treasure tables, gems and art objects, magic items, amulets and talismans, magic armor, magic bombs and oils, magic crystals, magic garments, magic instruments, magic rings, magic weapons, <laughs> potions, rods, sta sta staves, 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 and wands, scrolls and books, wondrous items, trade goods. Now, a lot of these tables still have to be done. Enchanted oddments, rare comestibles. I mean, a lot of this stuff is not finished yet. Rare fungi, rare herbs, and then appendices with a lot of uh, stuff that still needs to be done, including an intro adventure, a short starter adventure with pages for that. Rumors, general rumors, rumors in Blackswell, rumors in Castle Brackenwold, rumors in Copton on the Shiver, rumors in Dragon the Shantywood Isle, rumors in Vol and rumors per location. So awesome. So general rumors and then specific rumors for each place depending on where the players go or where they start. Uncommon spells, right? So these are not in the player's handbook. These are special spells that they can find by doing particular things. Some holy spells, some arcane spells. That's so cool. Hidden spells that you have prepared for the players that they can't learn in the ordinary course of the game that they don't even know about in the ordinary course of the game but that they can discover and then be given. That's such a great idea. With a fantastic index at the back. Uh, for all of this stuff. Now, each of these pages is hyperlinked, so you can click on it and be taken right to it. That's so good. And then you have credits for who created what for each of the uh, different pieces of art in this book, along with a glossary 
and the Dolmenwood book itself with the with the uh, DM's map on the back, the GM's map on the back, which is divided into a hex grid, although I don't know if you can see that perfectly clearly, but it is divided. Now, this is also, I think, hyperlinked. Yes, it is. So you can click on a particular hex and go to it. <laughs> that is so awesome. Why haven't people done that before? This is such an incredible book. This is the monster book. This is 137 pages. I'm only going to go through a few of these. But it's a similar idea. Monsters of Dolmenwood with a bestiary and appendices for each of these creatures. All right, so very, it just jumps right into it. Monsters of Dolmenwood, Denizens of the Deep, Dank Woods. And what you need to play this book with a great piece of art there of these crazy little gnomes. The monster statistics and how to break them down with some terrifying art there on the right for this creature. I wish they had a little indication of what kind of creature that was. Uh, they don't. Maybe they'll see it again later. Here's a great worm. And you begin the creatures. The antler wraith, the banshee, the barrow bogey, the basilisk, black tentacles, the bog corpse, the bog salamander, the boggin, the brain conch, the brambling, Bregle, different kinds, centaurs, different kinds, cobbins, cockatrice, crookhorn, crystalloids, Deerling does, deerling stags, devil goats, droon, 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 <laughs> elves, fairy horses, a femorian, not quite done, galoshers, gargoyles, gelatinous hulks, ghouls, etc., etc., gloams, goblins. The gloams, these were in the wormskin books, these gloams. Let's see how they've changed. So now they're shadow-wreathed undead entities composed of the corpses of crow-like birds. Appear either as a flock of ragged birds or as a gaunt man formed of the feathers, bones, and beaks of the flock. That's basically the same, I think, of the description there. You get the stat block now laid out in OSE terms, old school essential terms, basically, with what they have and what they can do. And then you have some extra things here. What is their collection? Each gloam obsessively collects a specific kind of macabre object. See collection for some examples. So maybe they collect ugh, mummified animals, tokens of love, children's corpses, dried human corneas. Nasty. Then you get encounters for them, traits for them, and lairs for them. Now, here's one of those things where you can take the wormskin books if you have them and supplement. At the bottom, you have names, which are to do. They're not done yet. Um, but you could add in what you have from for the gloms from those wormskin books if you happen to have them still. Grimalkins and harpies, paradins and Headless Riders, Jack-o'-lanterns and Kelpies, Mad Toms and Mannequins. All right, I'm not going to go through any more of this book because you get the idea. Um, how they're laid out, piece of art for each creature with uh, a special thing for each of them, an encounter, a trait, and a lair for them, along with their basic encounter numbers, behaviors, speech, if they have it, possessions, if they have it, hordes, if they have it, speed, morale attacks, level, AC, hit points, saves, and a brief description of the top. Great absolutely fantastic layout for this book as well. All right, well, I hope this has been interesting to you guys. I love the Dolmenwood setting, and I hope that you guys are interested in getting it if you don't already have it. Um, you can pre-order it. It's not out yet. Even these, which you know, I've kickstarted it, these are not complete. All right, cool. Well, I'll see you guys in another video.